Unfortunately, the Maximum Impact Tour is now over. Sadly, TNA has returned to America and the much smaller crowds they draw over here. And tragically, they're back to shooting TV in the Impact Zone. I'd rather get a high colonic with a hot poker. It's not as bad as it sounds, though. They debuted a new set, and I wouldn't have expected this since they've been trying to cut costs wherever they can these days, but it actually looks really good. I love how colorful it is. They got the two separate Trons, which is something new, plus the backlighting in the doorway where the wrestlers come out. It looks different, like they actually put some effort into designing and building it. This might be my favorite set that they've had, actually. Sure beats the hell out of the bare-bones stage they've been using lately. Thumbs up. Yes! Personal feuds were a big thing this week. A lot of the major storylines going on seem to have a real intensity to them that you only get with feuds that are really personal and heated and bitter. And when the feuds are done right, that tends to be when you get the most exciting and compelling stuff. I continue to be impressed with Bram. What a find this guy was. WWE really missed out with him. I mean, yeah, they had good reasons for firing him, but still, he was a loss, and he's proven that. This feud with him and Magnus is... is great. These guys just keep finding ways of upping the ante and making this rivalry more intense just when I think it's peaking. You know, Bram talking about Magnus's son, Magnus saying people are going to call the police to stop me if you go there. You know, Bram trying to kiss Mickey right in front of him, trying to make her kiss his boot. Really going below the belt, doing everything he can think of to hurt Magnus, not just physically, but emotionally too. And again, there's so much raw emotion here that Mickey just can't help from attacking the guy herself. I love that. This is the best friends turned bitter rivals angle that I was hoping Bobby Roode Eric Young would have been. And I know I keep comparing it to that feud, but I think it's a good comparison because in my mind, Bram and Magnus are getting the storyline right, whereas with Roode and EY, it was mostly screwing each other in matches and EY pile-driving Roode a lot, which could apply to any feud, really. This one feels so much more personal, and that's why it's far more compelling in my opinion. Another terrific installment in the Magnus Bram feud right here. And we get more personal stuff with the knockouts that was really good. We get this chilling video package building up Awesome Kong's dominance, and then she has this match with Brooke just overpowering her from bell to bell. I like that this was basically an enhancement match, but they still protected Brooke somewhat here. They gave her enough offense and hope spots that she didn't get squashed, which I was thankful about. There's never any doubt that Kong is going over like a beast, but Brooke is given a certain amount of respect here and doesn't get the jobber treatment. But regardless, Kong beats her decisively and then pulls out a table, and that's when things get interesting. Taryn Terrell tries to make the save, and we can see how much this thing with Kong is really eating at her now, how stressed out she is about it. She's just so incensed that she can't seem to beat Kong that she's throwing caution to the wind and just going nuts on her. And then Kong destroys her too. <laughs> and this got kind of brutal, actually. Kong smashed Terran's face on the guardrail, and she had a lump on her head the size of a softball from that, for God's sake. And then Terran goes through the table herself. I'm really liking this feud. They're building up the heel as this unstoppable force, with the face getting more and more desperate to take her down, and nothing she does is working. And it's almost to the point now where I think Terran might just snap and do something really crazy. Why is every girl on the show crazy? Jeff Hardy and the Revolution was the big one this week. Jeff is back after that brutal fall off the cage that looked like it killed him, after the Revolution took out Matt in the UK where Jeff wasn't allowed to travel to because of reasons, and this was another one that did a great job in upping the intensity. They have a really nice promo segment where James Storm shows everyone why he should have been a main eventer a long time ago. The bit with the watermelon was a nice touch. And then Hardy basically makes this a match in the lethal lockdown cage with a roof with weapons hanging from it because just a normal cage match is not enough after what the Revolution did to him. The Revolution hurt Jeff and his brother, and now he wants to hurt them back even worse. So they really justified the gimmick here, which TNA has a long history of not doing. That's good. Now, them doing another cage match so soon after lockdown I'm not crazy about, but they did enough to earn this one, I think. And then they did even more, with Hardy taking out the other Revolution members. The pre-tape with him and Koyo was almost disturbing. 
He keeps beating Koya down, and Koya just keeps dragging himself up and asking for more. It takes five beer bottles over the head to finally stop him. Jeff looked like a violent SOB, and Koya looked like a monster even though he got his ass whooped. The other Revolution members didn't look so good, but, you know, them's the breaks, I guess. And the match itself was great. I love the extremes they went to here. Weapons, low blows, the super Frankensteiner where Jeff had to hang from the roof to set it up. Just really selling how personal this was for him and how much he really just wanted to hurt James Storm. And the finish was really creative too, where he swings from the roof like a pendulum to do that big splash. Awesome main event. The only awkward part in all this was in the opener when Jeff tells the production guys to lower the cage ceiling and he heads for the ring only for the match to then end up happening later? That was a little weird. I do wonder where they can go with the revolution from here, though. It seems like it's losing steam now, and what with there being no shortage of factions on the show all of a sudden, I question how much further they can really take this. Speaking of factions, Rockstar Spud defends the X Division title, and him doing that just once means they've already done more with Spud as the X Division champion than they did with Loki. Drew Galloway distracts the BDC, and Spud gets the win. Great. Then Drew and the BDC have a better-than-usual exchange, which leads to a brawl where two of Drew's buddies show up to even the odds. Really strong promos from everybody here, although Drew does seem like he's kind of saying the same things every week, which is why I like that they're giving him a posse, because now we can start progressing this angle beyond Drew saying that he's standing up for wrestling and the BDC saying no, no, no. So we got Sean Ricker and Camacho. I'm not familiar with Ricker, and Camacho I've seen very little of, but it seems like most people on social media were happy about this. But... It's another fucking faction. We already had two of these things running around, this is number three! And TNA had already burned me out on factions before the Beatdown Clan showed up! The more of these things you do, the less important and unique they all seem. So, good luck with The Rising, I guess, but it's yet another faction in an increasingly long list. And I hate to say this, but I'm kind of over it at this point. Da -na -na -na. Oh, you were not aware of this? Something really important in putting over a big match or a big angle is the fallout. Not just the build-up and the payoff, but what comes after that, too. So I was really happy to see the video packages for Angle vs. Lashley from last week. Everyone's still talking about it. Angle has this moment in the ring where he puts over what winning the title meant to him. TNA did a really good job with sticking the landing here. And then we get the typical challengers come out one at a time demanding a title shot segment. All perfectly fine stuff. Although, Angle made a grave mistake in not taking EC3 more seriously. Our Lord of Wrestling does hold a victory over you already, Kurt. And he put you out of action for quite some time, lest you forget. Shut up and follow me. Anyway, it's a pretty standard segment, establishing everyone who's going to be in the title picture for the time being. It does everything it needs to do, and it does it pretty well. Also, we find out that the rude EY rivalry is still not done. Which is odd, because I thought they'd had the last match in the feud about three times now. Whatever. So we get a nice six-man tag match coming out of this. It's a solid segment overall, and it gets over that Angle has no shortage of quality challengers. I love EC3 being in there. Let's ride that wave of momentum after his awesome main event with Spud from two weeks back and just see how far that takes him. Now, I don't think Eric Young needs to be in that group, but hopefully this is more about him just wanting to stop Bobby Roode from being in there. Another really strong impact this week. They're giving me very little to complain about right now. The last few shows have been great. I'm still not wild about the idea of having another faction on the show, but they've got some really compelling feuds going right now, and nothing that outright sucks at the moment. I hope I didn't jinx it by saying that. But, yeah. Really good show. Good job, TNA. That's it for me. Peace.